All right, everyone, this is the final document analysis video for the final couple of documents for the final set of discussion questions for this ridiculous semester. So let's get right to it, shall we? In this video, I've got three documents to go through. The Gar Alperovitz document, the, Ta the Thomas Powers document, and the Richard Cohen piece. So let's jump right in to Gar Alperovitz. Beyond the Smithsonian flap, historians new consensus. Recall that at the end of the last presentation, I had done the document from Jim Norekis, which talked about that issue and the controversy behind the Smithsonian Museum's planned exhibit of the Enola Gay and the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima and the other one on Nagasaki. Well, this document, as you can see with the date, 1994, is about the same thing. It's about the Smithsonian exhibit, it's about the problems with the angst and animosity towards that, and looking at the historical issue. So if we get back into our discussion questions, we are looking at question 37 is the first one to start with. What were the results of both the U.S. Strategic Bombing Survey and the War Department Operations Division Study? <clears throat> so when we look at this, from Alperovitz, we're going to scroll down a little bit. Alperovitz forms this document, or frames this document, in a series of questions. And the first one he's asking is, in retrospect, was the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki necessary? Meaning, looking back at World War II, in hindsight, did we need to use these? For instance, the official U.S. Strategic Bombing Survey concluded, on the basis of a massive investigation, that Japan in all probability would have surrendered prior to November 1st, 1945, and would have certainly surrendered before December 31st, 1945, even if the atomic bomb had not been dropped, Russia had not entered the war in the Pacific, or even if no Allied invasion had been contemplated. So this bombing survey, which was done in 1946, concluded that if the U.S. had just kept doing what they were doing, if they just kept the naval blockade around Japan, if they just kept up the conventional bombing, if there was no atomic bomb, no Russian invasion to help the U.S., and no invasion, no landed invasion of the Japanese home islands, Japan finishes fighting and U.S. wins the war by November 1st or by December 31st at the latest of 1945. So there's no risk of casualties from a landed invasion, and there's no killing of Japanese civilians with an atomic bomb, and yet you still win the war. You just have to wait a couple more months in order to do it. In the same year, the War Department Operations Division did a study as well. And this was discovered only in 1989, which concluded that the Japanese leaders had decided to surrender and were merely looking for sufficient pretext to convince the die-hard army group that Japan had lost the war and must capitulate to the Allies. It judged that the entry of Russia into the war in early August would almost certainly have furnished this pretext and would have convinced all responsible leaders that surrender was unavoidable. So again, these two studies combined are showing that the dropping of the atomic bomb in all likelihood was not necessary to have beaten the Japanese. These studies were both done in 1946, just a few months after World War II had ended, and they're arguing that we probably didn't need to drop those bombs because Japan was already in dire straits and they were looking for a reason to give up. The Soviet Union entering the war probably would have given them that reason to stop fighting without having to use the atomic weapons. Without the Russians entering the war, without the U.S. planning an invasion of Japan, and without dropping the bombs, they still would have surrendered by November 1st or at the very latest by the end of the year of 1945. <clears throat> so the U.S. would have gotten everything that it wanted. It would have gotten a surrender, it would have won the war, it wouldn't have had to have dropped the atomic weapons, and it wouldn't have had to have sacrificed American lives in an invasion of mainland Japan. Okay, but that's looking back at hindsight, though. Hindsight is always 2020. What about the U.S. political leaders at the time, in 1945? What did they believe about the use of the atomic bombs? Or as Alperovitz phrases it, 
did U.S. policymakers nonetheless believe that using the atomic bomb was the only way to end the war? J. Samuel Walker, who is, at the time of this writing, was the chief historian of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, his study concluded, careful scholarly treatment of the records and manuscripts opened over the past few years have greatly enhanced our understanding of why the Truman administration used atomic weapons against Japan. The consensus among scholars is that the bomb was not needed to avoid an invasion of Japan. It is clear that alternatives to the bomb existed and that Truman and his advisors knew it. Especially important in this discussion, argues Al Perovitz, is the discovery of Truman's, quote, lost diary, which happened in 1978. Truman understood well before August 1945 the same point made by the War Department study, that the jolt of the Red Army attack on Japan in early August would so shock the already teetering Japanese that the fighting would likely end. <clears throat> George Marshall told Truman personally, one of the generals in the U.S. military, told Truman personally that the shock of a Russian declaration of war might well lever Japan into surrendering almost immediately. After the Soviet leader, Russian Stalin, uh, Joseph Stalin, excuse me, confirmed that Russia would declare war on Japan by mid-August, the president, Harry Truman's diary stated, finny japs when that comes about. So what we're seeing here is that Truman knew and had strong suspicions from even some of his main advisors and military generals that the involvement of the Soviet Union into the war would probably bring the war to an end and they wouldn't need to use the atomic weapons. It also seems clear to many scholars that U.S. political and military leaders understood that a minor modification of the unconditional surrender formula, allowing Japan to keep its emperor god, would likely have ended the fighting. This was done in the end, of course, Japan still as an emperor, but virtually everyone at the highest levels of U.S. government, except for the Secretary of State, urged that it be done before, not after, using the atomic bomb. And this talks about the co intercepted communication that we discussed in the last video with the Nathan Donahue document and gets into that, about Truman's diary referring to the telegram from Japanese emperor asking for peace. So we've got here information from recently discovered evidence from the 70s and 80s that indicates that Truman and his main advisors understood and believed that using the bomb was not necessary to get Japan to end the war. That they believed that Russia entering the war would end it. They believed that a they knew that Japan was looking for peace terms and all they had to do was modify their unconditional surrender formula and they could have ended the war without having to drop the bombs, without having to do a landed invasion, saving lives on both sides. Okay, but those are just the political leaders. Those are politicians, right? What about the military leaders? Those guys who are running the war, essentially. They probably thought that the bomb was necessary, right? Well, let's look at what Al Perovitz has discovered here. When General Dwight Eisenhower future president of the United States and the supreme allied commander over in Europe who planned and organized and ran the D-Day invasions, the invasion of northern France from England by U.S., British, and Canadian forces. When he was told about the decision to drop the bomb, he told Secretary of War Henry Stimson that the news gave him a feeling of depression. Eisenhower later recalled in his memoirs telling Stimson of my belief that Japan was already defeated and that dropping the bomb was completely unnecessary and that our country should avoid shocking world opinion by the use of a weapon whose employment was, I thought, no longer mandatory as a measure to save American lives. So one of the most lauded military leaders of World War II, so much in fact that he becomes president of the United States, says the bomb's not necessary. William Leahy, the conservative admiral who in 1945 held a position similar to today's chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, was even more outspoken. <clears throat> the use of this barbarous weapon at Hiroshima and Nagasaki was of no material assistance in our war against Japan. In being the first to use it, we adopted an ethical standard common to the barbarians of the Dark Ages. I was not taught to make war in that fashion. And wars cannot be won by destroying women and children. So, 
a member of the Navy, an admiral in the Navy, says the bomb isn't necessary, that we could have won this without using it. It's our barbaric weapon. It kills innocent people. Over 80% of the people killed in both Hiroshima and Nagasaki were civilians. They had nothing to do with the war. They weren't part active participants in the war. So this admiral is saying, no, 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 we don't need to use this weapon because we don't need to set the bar for war so low that it's okay to kill women and kids. Nor did the leaders of the Air Force demand that the atomic bomb be used. General Henry H. Hap Arnold, the Army for Air Force's commander, later said that it would always appear to us that atomic bomb or no atomic bomb, the Japanese were already on the verge of collapse. So even the Air Force, whose plane flew it over and dropped the bomb, you would think that the Air Force, who is trying to establish itself as a legitimate branch of the military, would say, yes, we need planes to drop atomic bombs. Even he's saying, no, it probably wouldn't have needed it. Japan was already on the verge of collapse even if we didn't use the atomic weapons, so it's not a necessary thing to end the war. <clears throat> so historians looking back on it, studies done within a few months of the end of the war, are saying that the bomb was not necessary. Political leaders at the time said that the bomb was not necessary. Military leaders at the time said that the bomb was not necessary. Let's get back into that question we explored briefly from the Donahue document about casualty numbers. We looked at that a little bit with the Norekis document about the articles in newspapers citing 225,000, 500,000, 1 million Allied casualties and how the U.S. In planners were only planning on 190,000 combat troops and they were anticipating only 46,000 casualties at the most. Well, Al Perovitz is going to do a little bit of digging into those numbers as well. <clears throat> what if Eisenhower and others were wrong, argue, asks Al Perovitz, and an invasion was necessary? Scholars as diverse in political orientation as the liberal Barton Bernstein and military historian John Ray Skates have studied the actual 1945 planning documents and agree on what they show. In November 1st, 1945 landing on Kyushu, a southern island in the Japanese island chain. Japan's made up out of like 300 individual islands as their nation. Might have resulted in 20 to 25,000 U.S. deaths in a worst case scenario. An invasion in spring of 1946 would have resulted, according to U.S. military planners at the time, in 46,000 deaths. Occasionally, Writers on the Hiroshima controversy quote William Leahy's comment of June 18th, 1945, in which he suggested there would be a 35% casualty rate during an invasion. This 35% figure is then applied to a total possible assault force which might have been involved in a Kyushu landing to suggest a huge number of U.S. deaths. During the same discussion, however, George Marshall presented far lower planning estimates. Moreover, Leahy's percentage was quickly challenged by the Chief of Naval Operations, and Leahy did not mention it again. That very same day, Leahy wrote in his private diary that he believed the war could easily be ended before an invasion. So some figures that are thrown about by scholars to inflate the numbers don't actually apply because the guy who submitted those numbers retracted them later and br didn't bring them up again. It is sometimes also held that more Japanese would have been killed if the conventional bombing of cities had been continued, but this, in fact, had been made a low priority by August 1945 on the basis of Air Force experience in Europe. So the casualty numbers, then, from the actual wartime planners in 1945 do not back up the numbers bandied about later. Just as a quick aside, where do those numbers come from, then? Well, Winston Churchill gave a speech after the war that said that the atomic bombs probably saved 1.2 million Allied lives if they had to invade the Japanese islands. That's a staggering number that has no documentary evidence to support it. <clears throat> as far as the numbers of like 500,000, that comes from Truman's diary and his memoirs that he wrote after the war ended. And it's interesting because an historian mentioned earlier here in this article, Barton Bernstein, who used to work at Stanford University, he looked at and found some of the drafts of Truman's memoirs, and every draft, the number got bigger and bigger and bigger. <clears throat>
At first, it's 200,000. Then it's 225,000. Then it's 300,000. Then in the final draft, it's 500,000. So Truman's memoirs can't really be trusted because the numbers kept getting inflated every time a new draft was written until he reached the worst case scenario of 500,000, which wasn't supported by any of the wartime planners at all. So if you hear stats thrown out about how many lives would be lost if we had to invade Japan, first of all, we would not have had to have invaded Japan. It is not a black and white issue. Either drop the bombs or invade Japan. There were alternatives to both of those. Secondly, those numbers are almost always going to be inflated, and the actual wartime planners were planning far fewer casualties if Japan had to be invaded. <clears throat> so after all that, the last question from this document, what reasons does Alperovitz propose then for why the atomic bombs were used? Why then were the atomic bombs used? Here, there is far more debate among scholars. Some historians hold that Truman feared he would be criticized as soft on the Japanese if he told them they could keep the emperor before using the bomb. Some writers also suggest that because huge sums were spent developing the new weapon, the American political leadership found it impossible not to use it. We talked about that in the last video, and we talked about that phenomenon before World War I. Yet another group has probed the intricacies of decision-making through an analysis of bureaucratic dynamics. Most relevant, and this is where Alperovitz gets to his point, to the Smithsonian flap is substantial scholarly acceptance of the once controversial idea that diplomatic issues, especially the hope of strengthening the West's hand against the Soviet Union, played a significant role in the decision. In his memoirs, Truman reported that Burns, the Secretary of State, told him in April 1945 that the atomic bomb might well put us in a position to dictate our terms at the end of the war. In May 1945, atomic scientist Leo Szilard conferred with the Secretary of State, Burns, and came away saying, Mr. Burns did not argue that it was necessary to use the bomb against the cities of Japan in order to win the war. Mr. Burns' view was that our possessing and demonstrating the bomb would make Russia more manageable in Europe. Although writers still debate precisely how much weight to accord to such Cold War factors, respected Yale historian Gaddis Smith speaks for many when he says it has been demonstrated that the decision to bomb Japan was centrally connected to Truman's controversial approach to the Soviet Union. <clears throat> so the Nathan Donahue document covered that same angle, remember, but he said, he framed it as, that's more of a secondary or an ancillary benefit. The main reasons was like saving lives and stuff like that. Well, actually, Al Perovitz is citing historians like Gaddis Smith, Truman's memoirs with what the Secretary of State told him, citing those factors, citing those pieces of evidence to say, well, actually, no, it seems like for some of the men who were in leadership at the time, the main concern was not beating the Japanese, because as we've already considered, they thought they had them beat already, but using the atomic weapons as political pressure on the Soviet Union to get more concessions out of them. So that's the Alperovitz document. That gives you a lot of really good ammunition that you can use, no pun intended, for the second essay prompt on whether or not you're going to use your new superweapon. The second document to go over is from The Atlantic. It comes from an author named Thomas Powers. And I found this document fascinating. It's a bit long, I'll admit, but the conclusions he comes to at the end I thought were fascinating because it seems like he's leaning one direction throughout most of the article, and then he kind of goes in the opposite direction when he gets near the end. And he's looking at this through the lens of morality, essentially. For number 42, according to Thomas Powers, what question have historians and others chosen to answer instead of the question, was it right, morally right, to drop the bombs on two cities full of civilians? So let's scroll down and get to that. There's a bit of a long introduction here. Was it right? <clears throat> Harry Truman is not the only one to have disliked the question. Historians of the war, of the invention of the atomic bomb, and of its use on Japan have almost universally chosen to skirt the question of whether killing civilians can be morally justified. They ask instead 
wasn't necessary. So they don't want to get involved in the moral quandaries of this. So instead, they put up almost a straw man argument and say, well, what well, was it necessary? Independent of was it morally right, did we have to do it? And I think that's where you might get into, this is my take on this, I think that's where you get into some of the inflated casualty numbers and the black and white fallacies that you see when you talk about the discussions of the atomic bomb. People relegate it to just, we had to use the bomb or invade Japan. Invading Japan comes with huge casualty numbers. Bombing Japan comes with fewer casualties. Therefore, bombing Japan was necessary. And some even go so far as to say, therefore, it was morally right. Although, as we've seen, the argument about needing to either drop the bomb or invade is not correct, not the entire story, and the numbers bandied about about the cost of invading Japan aren't right either. So I think when you break some of those down, you then return to the question, was it morally correct to do what the United States did? But most people choose to answer the question, was it necessary? Which is a different issue entirely. Besides the, quote, imperial dynasty, what concerned the peace faction in Japan's government, as well as the emperor himself, as World War II was winding down? So let's scroll down a bit to get to this as well. <clears throat> what Truman did not know, but what has been well established by historians since, is that the peace faction in the Japanese cabinet feared the utter physical destruction of the Japanese homeland the forced removal of the imperial dynasty, and an end to the Japanese state. So it wasn't just that the United States was going to take their emperor from them. That's not the only thing they were afraid of. They were afraid of the total destruction of the Japanese government and the total physical destruction of all of Japan. After the war, it was also learned that Emperor Hirohito, a shy and unprepossessing man of 44 whose first love was marine biology, felt pressed to intervene by his horror at the bombing of Japanese cities. The devastation of Tokyo left by a single night of firebomb raids on March 9th and 10th of 1945, in which 100,000 civilians died, had been clearly visible from the palace grounds for months thereafter. So the emperor himself was incredibly concerned about the loss of innocent Japanese lives and the destruction of that was being wrought upon Japan and the utter physical devastation that Japan was suffering from through repeated rounds of U.S. bombing. <clears throat> what factors contributed for number 44 to the bombing of cities in World War II? Thomas Powers is trying now to place the atomic bomb usage in the larger context of bombing civilians in the entirety of World War II to try to give us maybe another angle that we can understand the decision to drop the bombs on. The bombing of cities in the Second World War was the result of several factors. The desire to strike enemies from afar and thereby avoid the awful trench warfare slaughter of 1914 to 1918. The industrial capacity of the Allies to build great bomber fleets. The ability of German fighters and anti-aircraft to shoot down attacking aircraft that flew by daylight or at low altitudes. The inability of bombers to strike targets accurately from high altitudes. The difficulty of finding all but very large targets, that is, cities, at night. The desire of airmen to prove that air forces were an important military arm. The natural hardening of hearts in wartime. And the relative absence of people willing to publicly ask publicly if bombing civilians was right. So a lot of factors, I don't need to rehash all of them, you can understand this pretty easily. A lot of different factors go into why bombing cities and therefore civilians was a common practice by all sides in World War II. The Brits did it, the Nazis did it, the fascists did it, the French did it, the US did it, the Japanese did it. Everybody who was partaking in World War II did it. Interestingly enough, the legacy of World War I is still a major consideration here. The terrible results of World War I, with four years on the Western Front of trench warfare and soldiers coming home with PTSD 
At the time, they called it shell shock because they didn't understand that it was PTSD. The physical and mental toll it took on bodies, those who didn't survive and those who did survive. The pointlessness of this, of all of that strategy, the inability to come up with something other than marching over the top and attacking trenches, like you learned in the PowerPoint, all were still on the minds of people during World War II. Unfortunately, those considerations then played into the idea that we have better technology in World War II that could be used to wreak even more havoc on innocent people. It goes into, I'm not going to go into a, these paragraphs, but it talks about how both the British and the U.S. initially tried in World War II to do, quote, strategic bombing, where they would only hit military targets, they'd fly low so they can only hit military targets, they'd fly during the day. But because their bombers kept getting shot down so quickly by the German Air Force and German anti-aircraft guns, they had to then switch over to massive carpet bombing, essentially, of entire cities, which resulted in civilian deaths escalating in number. <clears throat> so by the time you even get to the dropping of the atomic bombs, bombing civilians from afar, from high up altitudes, was already a common practice that was being employed by everybody at the time. So the morality of that may not have been as big of a factor as you might think when it comes to atomic bomb calculations because people were already doing it. Now that doesn't mean that using the atomic bombs was, was morally right, because two wrongs don't make a right, as they say, but it may give us a window into the thinking of the people doing the planning and decision-making at the time. Why was Japan especially suitable for, bombing, uh, for fire bombing raids? One of the things that was mentioned in an excerpt I read just a few seconds ago was that Tokyo got hit by fire bombing raids, bombs that were incendiary in nature, using napalm to set everything on fire to burn large amounts of cities and the people living in them. And if we scroll down a little bit more here... I think I've passed it already. Yes, I have. Apologies for this. As I'm scrolling, scrolling, scrolling to find the answer that I wanted you to see. No, maybe I didn't go over it. Nope, there it is. There it is, finally. Okay, I'm back on track. Apologies for the delay. The ferocity of the air war eventually adopted by the United States against Germany was redoubled against Japan which was even better suited for fire raids because so much of the housing was made of paper and wood and were suited for precision bombing because of its awful weather and unpredictable winds at high altitudes. So because Japan is, is a somewhat rocky set of islands and these hills and mountains create uneven airflows and weird wind patterns, it's difficult in Japan to do precise bombing raids to just hit military targets and try to avoid civilian deaths as much as possible. That and because many of the Japanese homes were made out of wood, they were not made out of concrete or plaster or anything like that, because a lot of them had kind of, if you've seen maybe in movies or in popular media, the Japanese uh, shoji screens, those are made out of paper as well, and those catch fire very easily. So firebombing is something that was specifically effective against the Japanese because of the physical conditions of the territory and the physical conditions of the city. Besides ending the war against Japan, what else did the atomic bomb accomplish, according to the author? This is where you begin to see him turning a bit. It almost seems like up to this point, he's going to ultimately conclude that dropping the atomic bombs was bad, that it was morally wrong. Now, though, with these last two questions, we're going to get to him kind of moving in the opposite direction of that. So let's see if I can have better luck finding this one. <clears throat> what did the do dropping of the atomic bombs do besides ending the war? The scale of the attacks and the suffering and destruction they caused also broke the warrior spirit of Japan, bringing to a close a century of uncontrolled militarism. The undisguisable horror of the bombing must also be given credit for the following 50 years in which no atomic bombs were used, and in which there was no major war between great powers. 
It is this combination of horror and good results that accounts for the American ambivalence about Hiroshima. It is part of the American national gospel that the end never justifies the means, and yet it is undeniable that the end, stopping the war with Japan, was the immediate result of brutal means. So he's arguing here that the dropping of the atomic bombs not only ended World War II, but it reigned in and broke the militarism of Japan that had been growing for the last close to 100 years. It prevented war from breaking out between major powers in the 50 years since this article was written in the 1990s as well. And it also has to be credited for there being no more nuclear war because everyone saw the scale of destruction that happened with atomic bombings. And when the Soviets and others began developing their own atomic weapons, everyone remembered Hiroshima. Now, personally, I would argue that there are more factors than just the atomic bombs that go into why there was no more major wars after World War II, even though there were wars. The Korean War started in 1950, five years afterwards. The Vietnam War happened, started with the French in the 1960s, carried on with the United States in the 1970s. There were wars taking place in southeastern, Euro in southeastern Europe as late as the 1990s. So yeah, there were no more major wars between like the U.S. and the Soviet Union and other major powers, but there are other factors besides just the atomic weapons that went into that. So I think Thomas Powers is reaching a bit when he's making that claim. But still, some of the other claims he's on more firm ground with about the results of the atomic weapons. And then finally, from this document, near the end of the article, in the second to last paragraph, what is the author's ultimate conclusion about the use of atomic weapons. It is sadness, not scorn, says Powers, that I feel now when I think of Truman's telling himself that he was not killing all those kids. <clears throat> the bombing was cruel, but it ended a greater, longer cruelty. So you get the sense here that Thomas Powers has come to the point where he's not saying that the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki was necessarily morally correct. He's arguing that it's still incredibly cruel for the United States to have done that to Japanese citizens and civilians. But those bombs ended an even bigger, much larger cruelty that was World War II. Despite the fact that it was over in Europe for a few months already, it ended all the stuff going on in Asia. It ended the prison camps. It ended the slave labor that Japan was utilizing throughout all of Southeastern Asia. It ended any other fighting that would have had to have taken place. It ended more bombing raids and made them unnecessary. Like if you continued bombing into November or December of 1945, how many more Japanese people are going to get killed? You don't have to do that now because you use the atomic weapons. So he's ultimately, conclude, ultimately concluding that everything about World War II was cruel. Everybody was doing cruel things. Nobody's morally clean on this. The atomic bombs included. The atomic bombs had the advantage, though, of ending a much larger cruelty that was taking place and had been taking place for a number of years in both Asia and in Europe. So it almost seems like he's making kind of a tacit argument that the bombs were kind of a good thing, despite the fact that they were so cruel in and of themselves. All right, last one, last document, and last question. This is also from the Washington Post, just like the Gar Alperovitz article uh, was. And this is Richard Cohen arguing right around the time that President Obama was making a visit to Japan. And there were some who were calling for him to issue an official apology to Japan for our bombing of the two Japanese cities at the end of World War II. And Cohen is weighing in with his opinion on this. So one question to deal with here. What arguments does Richard Cohen propose to defend the decision to drop the atomic bombs? Cohen is also going to be arguing against another article written in the online news magazine The Nation, and the three points it makes about why Obama should apologize for dropping the atomic bomb. Cohen is going to respond to that specifically with his points. And he's going to argue 
But an imminent Japanese surrender was hardly apparent at the time. <clears throat> Instead, even as the war was ending, the Japanese fought nearly to the last man on Iwo Jima, a month-long battle in which almost 7,000 U.S. Marines were killed. Of the 21,000 Japanese soldiers on the island, only about 200 were taken prisoner. Some held out for weeks in caves. Still later in 1945, the Japanese fought tenaciously until mid-June to hold Okinawa. That battle cost 14,000 American lives. So his argument here is that during the U.S.'s island hopping campaign, you learned about that in the PowerPoint, and I showed you a map that illustrated the island hopping. Almost every island chain that the U.S. advanced to that got closer and closer to Japan, the Japanese were sacrificing more and more of their own soldiers to slow the Americans down with the goal of making things so bad for the Americans that the press and the people would put pressure on the leadership to come to an agreement with Japan. And so Cohen's therefore arguing that if they were fighting tooth and nail for island chains in the Pacific, how much more violently would they have fought for their own homeland? And there was really no guarantee that they were going to surrender. Although, to be fair, we just looked at the Alperovitz document that that's not necessarily 100% true. There was a strong indication at the time that Japan was about to fold up. It might have taken a few more months, but it was there. But it's still an argument that he's going to make here, so if you want to use that for your own essay, feel free to. <clears throat> there was reason to believe that Japan would never surrender, and as I just mentioned, that an invasion of the main Japanese islands would result in staggering U.S. casualties. Again, though, the planners at the time disagreed. If that was the case, then any weapon that saved American lives would be considered justified. That's an argument that comes out of this, that any weapon to save any amount of American lives will be justified. So then the argument could become that, well, even if only 46,000 American lives would be killed in a landed invasion, if we use the atomic bomb, no American lives have to be spared, have to be, or have to be sacrificed, excuse me. All American lives get spared. And so he's the president of the United States as Harry Truman. Therefore, he should have made that decision, even if a smaller number than normally bandied about would have actually died. But at the same time, continues Cohen, the Japanese were doing their level best to prove that the bigots were right. They had abused and murdered prisoners of war. They had massacred civilian populations, like the rape of Nanking from the PowerPoint. And, no small matter this, they were flying their own airplanes into U.S. fighting ships. The famous kamikaze attacks cost the Japanese almost 4,000 pilots and killed 5,000 American sailors. Americans had to wonder what kind of people would sacrifice their own in pursuit of what, by then, was a losing cause. Little wonder we thought of the Japanese then as we now think of the Islamic State. So, even though he's not totally excused excusing the racism that the American people were sucked into through propaganda about the Japanese, and that is a true statement. There was propaganda about the Japanese that was more than a, had more than a tinge of racial components to it. Cohen is pointing out that, yeah, but the Japanese were in actuality committing a lot of war crimes. And so if the atomic bomb ended those war crimes more quickly, then it's justified in its use. I found this article from Cohen interesting because I think he does a relatively fair job of presenting relevant questions about this topic. Could a demonstration bomb have gotten Japan to surrender? Who knows? Was Truman intent on accelerating the surrender so as to keep the Soviets out of Japan? Maybe. <clears throat> Was the loss of Japanese civilian life out of proportion to the projected loss of American life? Probably. If you believe the planners in 1946, almost definitely, about five times as much. These questions are all well worth pondering. So Cohen's not blithely dismissing arguments against the America using the atomic bombs. He's saying those are all legit questions that have to be investigated a bit more, but so is this one. <clears throat> 
What could Truman have said to Americans who lost a loved one in an invasion of the Japanese home islands if they knew he had a weapon that could have ended the war and not used it? <clears throat> what in the dead of night when sleep did not come and he stared at the ceiling could he have said to the American dead? I chose Japanese lives over yours. Truman did what he had to do. No apology is needed. This, for my take, for my money, is the strongest argument Cohen makes here. A few of his arguments are, we've already seen how they're not going to fly because of other research that's been done. This one, though, is a very compelling argument. What is Truman supposed to say if he decided on the landed invasion of Japan and 46,000 Americans lost their lives? What is he supposed to say six months later or a year later when news is leaked about the existence of the atomic weapons and some grieving mother who lost a son and a brother, say, in the fighting against the Japanese? If she comes to him and she says, you had a weapon that could have ended the war without needing the lives of my son and my brother, why did you not use that weapon? Why did you protect Japanese civilians over my soldier relatives? Why did you make that decision? What is he supposed to say to that person? How is he supposed to ang answer angry editorials written in the press of that same nature? How is he supposed to address that? I personally have no idea. Which is why I think people who run for president of the United States are psychopaths. All of them. Who wants that responsibility on their shoulders? Not me. <clears throat> That's one of the strongest arguments I think that you can make uh, in favor of using these atomic weapons. Although, I will say that I have heard an interesting counter-argument. Interesting not just for what it is, but for who makes that argument. I have heard the counter-argument that even if there were going to be 46,000 Americans who would die in a landed invasion versus 250,000 who would, and in fact did, die because of the atomic bombings, that Truman still should have not used the bombs because the Americans who, were sent to, who would have been sent to invade Japan are soldiers. And that's what soldiers do as opposed to civilians in Japan who were incinerated by the two atomic bomb blasts. That's an interesting counter-argument because the only people, and I mean this quite literally, the only people that I have ever heard in my classes make that argument are former military personnel. Former soldiers are the only ones I have ever heard make that counter-argument. I had a class a couple of years ago during the summer where eight out of nine students were former military. And every single one of them, once somebody made that point, every single one of them agreed. One of them was sitting in the back. He had been in the army. <clears throat> and as I was showing them and we were discussing this, he raised his hand and he goes, yeah, but that's what soldiers are supposed to do, though. They fight wars. They invade and they risk their lives so that civilians don't have to. So why use a bomb that destroys civilians when you could use soldiers to end the war? And I was honestly kind of surprised by that because I thought that they would be on the side of protecting their fellow soldiers. But no, they weren't. Not in that class and not from other classes that I've seen later on. Now, that doesn't mean that every single former military person I've had agrees, but the only ones who have made that argument are former military, which I find fascinating. Although somebody did bring up, okay, yeah, but right now the U.S. has an entirely volunteer army. In World War II, that wasn't the case. In World War II, a lot of guys were being drafted into the army. So maybe not all of them would have been willing participants in an invasion of the Japanese islands and would be willing to sacrifice their lives so that the war could end. Maybe they were doing it completely unwillingly because they were drafted into the war and not volunteers. So perhaps a nice back and forth on that specific issue. <clears throat> okay, but that does it 
That is the last of the documents and the last of the modules for the last of the essay questions, wrapping up the last of the document analysis videos. Therefore, at this point, the only thing you've got left to do is write your last essay on either appeasement, yes or no, or using your new super weapon, yes or no. As always, if you have any questions about the essay, questions about the citations, you want to send me a couple of paragraphs to look over before the due date, you have just general questions you want to ask about setting up your essay, whatever the case is, do not hesitate to email me either through Canvas, my SE4 email, or my Gmail that are on the top front page of the syllabus that I had given you. <clears throat> Thanks everybody for being so patient this semester and watching all of these videos and utilizing them to write your essays. I know this semester turned into an absolute train wreck because of the coronavirus. I did the best I could to try to make it as smooth of a transition as possible. Hopefully it worked for you. If it didn't, my sincerest apologies for that, but there's little that I can do in the face of this pandemic and in the face of the decisions that the college made. That's way above my pay grade, what they're doing and the decisions that they're making in response to what the state of Michigan is doing. So again, if you have any questions, make sure you email me. Thank you everybody for the semester. Good luck on everything that you're going to do in the future. I love you guys. You guys are going to be awesome. In trying times like this, it's important to make sure that you stay calm as much as you can and don't fall into panic and hysteria. Stay informed. Try to seek out good quality sources of information because information is power. The more good information you have, the more power you've got to effectively deal with this. Be smart. Make smart decisions. Think through what you're going to do. Do I have to go in person to the grocery store? Can I order online and have my groceries delivered? Should I wear a mask when I go out? Do I really need to go to that public place? Think through your decisions, please. Not just how they're going to affect you, but how they're going to affect everyone around you. And lastly, be safe. Follow the CDC guidelines. Stay home as much as you can. Wash your hands as much as you can. Avoid public places as much as you can. Only when you have to go out there. So remember all those things. To be informed. Be calm. Be smart. And be safe.